What do you think of when you think of Oregon to the Big Ten? Well, yeah. I mean, when I think of Oregon to the Big Ten, the talent is through the roof, right? They've got the talent. The question is whether the style of play will translate to the Big Ten Conference. And on, on the, I'll start out with, with the bad news for Oregon, for Oregon fans. The bad news for Oregon fans is you lost twice to Washington last year, and you saw what Michigan did to Washington in the national championship game. Uh, Michigan put up 103 on the – or 303, excuse me, on the ground for eight a carry. Um, so that, that's the bad news if you're Oregon. The good news if you're Oregon is you've got a coach in Dan Lanning who is not stubborn and will adjust. So he's going to build a team that's going to play Big Ten football, I believe, The question, I think, is how long it takes them to build that team. Is it this year? Is it next year? Is it the year after that? So how long does it take this squad and this roster to play that Big Ten brand of football that you really, I think, have to play to be successful in the Big Ten? Do you think that they can run the football effectively and also stop the run effectively? Oregon, you know, stop, stopping the run, they stopped the run really well last year. I believe they held opponents to 3.5 yards a carry, if I'm not mistaken. So I do believe they can stop the run effectively. Um, especially, I don't know if you've got the same level of run offenses in the Big Ten this year necessarily. Michigan, of course, loses a lot on that offensive line. Um, Ohio State, I'm not sure if they're going to be a complete ground and pound team either. And Penn State, of course, Drew Aller, they're going to try to lean on him, hopefully, to push the ball downfield a little bit. So I'm not sure there will be as much pressure on that run defense as there may have been in the past couple of years. And they're a really good run defense. So so I, I, I do think so. I do think this Oregon team is going to hold their own um, defending the run. Now, whether they're going to be able to run the ball or not, I think that's a different question. They ran for a ridiculous yards per carry last year. It was someplace in the sixes, I believe, as a yes. team, which is absurd. But a lot of that was due to the spread offense they played and how good of a deep ball threat Bo Nix is. Um, So due to that, teams had to spread their defense, which let um, C.J. Verdell in the run game be so impactful. So I'm not sure if they'll have quite the same success in the run game as they did last year. I think when it comes to C.J. Verdell, he's been like, he was quick, but he graduated um, forever ago. I think you're thinking of Irving and... Sorry, Irving. Lucky Irving and Jordan James. I love Jordan James this year. Excuse me, Irving. Yeah. yeah. Irving, not CJ Verdell. No, no, he's not still playing. You know, he play, Bo, might be a similar age as Bo Nix, but, uh, but did not play with him last year. Yeah. I think they'll be able to run really effectively. I think their run offense might be the best in the Big Ten. Um, I think that their run rushing attack, probably given what they return at O-line, with a Johnny Cornelius, Josh Connerly Jr., and I think Marcus Harper the second started some at guard last year, and the way they recruit, and they return their tight end, which always helps, and Jordan James had some starts, and Gabriel is a proven QB, and he can run the football as well. I think all of that combined probably gives Oregon the most explosive rushing attack, and probably the one with the highest floor and then I would go probably Penn State for highest floor and Penn State I'd also probably give the edge to with power running Ohio State's is probably the most boomer bust in the sense that their O-line could be bad but their running back room's the best in the country I think Oregon's question is can you stop the run because I, I know you in your opinion they're good and I think that their defense last year was very admirable, but they also did not play a tough schedule. Like they played USC, who had a mediocre O line. Washington was the best team that they played by a mile, and Washington coached circles around them twice. But they're they're there, and I think they can compete in the Big Ten and even for the title. I have them reaching the national championship just as soon as this year. Do you think that like Short term and long term, this is probably the best former Pac-12 team in the in the Big Ten, like as a program. I do think so, and I think so largely because of Dan Lanning. If there was a coach other than Dan Lanning at Oregon, I wouldn't be nearly as confident in their ability to adjust. Because sometimes you see teams that they come to a new conference or they play. You travel to play a Big Ten team or an SEC SEC team, and you and 
playing ACC ball or Pac-12 ball does not work in those conferences. And we've seen that over time. I believe history backs me up there. Um, Dan Lanning, he already preaches physicality. So that's already his motto. And I can only imagine he, he's going to be telling this team in the offseason, hey, guys, ex- people expect you to get bullied. People expect Michigan to bully you. People expect Ohio State to bully you. Um, and, you know, he coaches with a bit of an attitude and a chip on his shoulder. So I think he's going to build that tough culture. I completely agree. Before the the Nick Saban retiring set off a ton of dominoes that I didn't expect. I don't think anyone expected Saban to retire. But um I thought it was going to be Washington who'd be the best off before Kalen DeBoer left, but we'll get to them later of course. Uh, but right now I'd say Oregon. I think Oregon is the trench play, the recruiting, the head coach, the strength and conditioning and development to succeed and they they even have the potential i think to be at some point i don't think now but maybe in the future the big ten's best program um next up what about ucla i feel like we're going in an opposite direction here because i have ucla is probably the worst in the future of the big ten and even in the present what do you think about that i'm gonna have to agree with you here I'd love to be an optimist for the UCLA program and disagree with you and tell you why they're going to be good. But I just, Sam, I don't, I, I, I just simply don't believe that they're going to, that they're going to be good in the big 10. Um, you know, they have, they have history there. There is history there for UCLA. So maybe something is built there, but anytime you're losing your head coach, I mean, from a team that frankly was just not very good last year and you're going to, what I would certainly classify as a tougher conference. I, I think you'd agree with me on that. I think most people yeah. would agree with me on that. You know, it's, it's, I don't think you have to get, it's just going to be tough. UCLA last season, just, just glancing over, over really surface level stats, they ran the ball for 4.5 per rush, which is solid. That's good for 44th in the country. Their run defense was actually really good. So that was the strength of this squad. They only gave up 2.7 yards per rush. That's just about flush with the that elite Michigan D-line from last year, who obviously won the national championship. So the run, the, the physicality on defense is there for UCLA. But the, at some point, you do have to have good skill position players. And I'm not sure they're going to be there within the first couple of years in the, in the Big Ten. I buy that. And their defense, their what was interesting about UCLA last year is their defense was awesome with DeAnton Lynn, who's now at USC as their DC. Like their, their defense was incredible. It was the biggest turnaround defense in the country, but their problem was their offense, despite being coached by Chip Kelly was not good. It, it stank it. And it really took a nosedive toward the end of the year when they started on that losing streak and talks about him being fired, kept resurfacing. And I thought entering this season, he would be fired mid-season. They would just collapse and not and and be one of the worst teams in the country because they lose most of their defense. The players that aren't going to the NFL are transferring out. Like they lost a few of their defensive backs to USC, for example, their rival. And they lose Carson Steele at running back. They lose Duke Clemens, their really good center. They bring in some transfers on the O-line and wide receiver and also on defense. But they do lose that entire defensive staff. And Chip Kelly, he did not leave this team. He did not leave the Bruins in a good position. And their new head coach, Deshaun Foster, we'll have to see how he does. He got promoted from being a running backs coach. Uh, He was not put in a good position by Chip Kelly at all. So I think UCLA will have to give him time uh, to see what he can do there. Yeah, certainly, especially going to a new conference is really the timing all works out in the worst possible way. If you're a Bruins fan, Um, like you said, you're losing talent, you lose your head coach. And now guess what? Congratulations. You get to play Michigan, Ohio State and Penn State year in and year out, not literally because there's so many teams in the big 10, everybody doesn't play everybody anymore, but, but you get the gist. You're, you're going to really play a physical brand of football. that can really beat you up. Absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, I think UCLA and Oregon are polar opposites in terms of program direction. I could see UCLA becoming a, a poverty school, like a, a Rutgers or a Maryland at the beginning of joining the Big Ten or Northwestern in, in Fitzgerald's final two seasons. I, I could see them spiral out of control. I mean, they were not good on average in, in the Pac-12 either. They, they Pac-10, Pac-8... Yeah, but they ha they've had some rough years in the 21st century, and now they're in a tougher, deeper conference. Let's look at their rival and, I would say, their bigger brother, even though UCLA destroyed USC last year. What do you think of Lincoln Riley? I imagine a year ago you would say they're going to enter the Big Ten and they'll have to make some adjustments, but Riley's a top-ten head coach. And now... 8-5 and five with Caleb Williams and a defense that was worse than just about anyone predicted. What do you think of USC right now? Man, it's really hard to buy Lincoln Riley's stock, having seen that he is so far unable to turn out good defenses or competent defenses. I mean, watching USC games last year, was was rough and i'm not saying this for dramatic effect i it was physically frustrating to watch usc's defense play watching a big 10 game or an sec game or even a big 12 game and then watching usc was so just the the, co the coaching on defense whether that falls on riley whether that falls on the defensive staff was just not there just no discipline from defensive players especially tackling and rallying to the ball so first of all, that has to be fixed, especially in the Big Ten. And teams, listen, stereotypes aren't always true. In fact, a lot of times they're not in general in life. But sometimes sports stereotypes are true. And USC has a stereotype recently. Riley teams more specifically have a stereotype of being soft. And so they're going to come into the Big Ten and a lot of Big Ten teams are going to try to punch them in the mouth. So they better be ready for that. And I mean, this is a squad that they gave up 4.8 yards per rush defensively. That's good for 106th in the country. You know, that's just not great. And when you're coming to such a physical conference, I, I think it's, I think it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Um, they, what I, I, I can see someone buying stock in Riley only because they got a good DC in DeAnton Lynn. They hired Eric Henderson, who was the D line coach of the Rams they, they, they got an NFL D-line coach to be their D-line coach. Um, they brought in North Dakota State's head coach as their linebackers coach. So they're, they're, they're trying everything they can do to build um, a good defense and a good staff. And Doug Belk, Houston's defensive coordinator, who's done a good job at developing secondary players, they brought him in as their secondary coach. So they're loaded at defensive staff. But yeah. for, and for me, it's like... Jim Knowles hired Ohio State, and their defense looked good in 2022 for the first 11 games, but they still missed tackles, they still allowed big plays, and against the best offenses they faced all season, uh, Michigan and Georgia, they, they crumbled. And I think it's going to take USC a year at minimum for that defense to be anything that resembles a top 25 unit. And their schedule is tough, too. I know we're talking about, like, long-term, not just short-term. In the short-term, I think you you got to keep the expectations reasonable. And maybe people, especially USC fans, will disagree with that. But, yeah, depending on who you were, um, games, like, watching USC was, like you said, rough. I hated it. When they actually lost some games, it was it was like watching Iowa lose a game. It was the best thing ever because finally a, this team that defies all laws of what a college football team should be is smacked back down to reality. Like, I, I hate purely one-dimensional teams who intentionally practice cognitive dissonance and act like their way is the best, and then they're not the best. It, it's delusional, and USC, and I'd say Riley teams, even some at Oklahoma, have been delusional teams. I mean, they, they there's this obvious ceiling, and we'll see 
what USC can do. I think long-term they have an awesome future as long as they keep Riley in the long run and the hires work out. Uh, what do you think about their long-term future? I'm curious. Yeah, I do think they have a long-term future. I don't think it's quite as great as Oregon with Dan Lanning. But, I mean, let's let's be honest. Bottom line, is Lincoln Riley is a good coach. Um, now, has he struggled defensively horrendously? Yes, <laughs> he has, and let's not sugarcoat that. But overall, he's a desirable hire. And a lot of schools around the country right now, at the snap of a finger, would drop their guy and say, give us Lincoln Riley. And there's a reason for that. He develops quarterbacks like nobody you've ever seen before. Um, he just, uh, all his offenses are explosive year in and year out. I mean, he just developed multiple Heisman trophy winners. The guy has a way with offenses. If that defensive staff you're talking about that you were, that you were just highlighting works out, then man, they could be elite. The question is when, and if that staff will work out, but, but I, I do, I do buy his stack long-term his stock, excuse me, long-term in the big 10. Yeah. One more question before we move on. Do you think he's overrated as a head coach? At this point, no, because I think enough people slander him that he's not overrated. Um, I think there's a general sentiment in college football right now that he's not a championship coach, um, which is fair. But because of that, I don't think he's overrated anymore. What, what about you? What, I'm curious. That's a fair point. I was going to say yes, but now I'll say yes in terms of national writers. I think the public probably accurately rates him, if not maybe hates him too much. He's yeah. certainly a top 25, top 20 head coach, and my head coaching rankings are weird. So for the average head coaching ranking, he's probably higher than that. But yeah, I mean, I think that Look, he, he won championships in the Big 12 at Oklahoma, so he maintained a good program. He was recruiting highly there all of his years. Smaller classes, yes, but they worked, and he did well at developing them. And at USC, he's recruited well, used the portal well, and his teams look like they did at Oklahoma. The question is, can he change? And if he can change, then absolutely. He's going to be an elite head coach who can win a national championship if he makes that jump. And finally, we have the Washington Huskies. Washington loses everything, all but one of their 22 starters and their head coach and most of their staff. They do keep their strength and conditioning coach, who, mind you, is one of the best in the game. But that's really it. What yeah, I mean, think? Washington. Yeah, well, Washington, I think it's going to be rough for them this year. As a Washington fan, I think you have to look at this as a rebuilding year. Obviously, you would have loved to come into the Big Ten off that national championship appearance. Your offense was electric last year, and, and, you, and you try to make some noise. But that's probably not going to be the case given what they lost. Like you said, you lose all but one starter. That's just – that's absurd. And it's a testament, though, in a way to how good that team was. Those They have players that are desirable both at the NFL level – and for other schools. So that was an elite team. And unfortunately for them, the combination of having a lot of talent and your head coach leaving means you lost everybody. So Washington returns a whopping 19% of their offensive production. That's clearly not good. Uh, they, re they do return 52% of their defense. So maybe that's something you can build on if you're Washington. I'm returning some of that defensive staff um, of that, of that. Well, that's not players wise. That's defensive production and, and tech. We we're just talking total tackles and stuff like that. And frankly, I'm not sure how that calculation is, is calculated, but that's according to ESPN. And, but the offense is just going to be tough, man. Going from that offense last year, that was really personally my favorite offense to watch in the country. Um, love watching Michael Penix. Um, it's just, it's, it's hard to see a world in which they win more than seven games. That's understandable. They Cameron Davis was injured entering last year, but he had a really good 2021 season, and they bring in Jonah Coleman at running back from Arizona. So their run game could be underrated. They bring in Will Rogers, former Mississippi State quarterback, and I think that they— 
look, they got Steve Belichick as their defensive coordinator. And no, that's not a joke. That's that's who they hired as their DC. They could they 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 could be a top twenty five team at their ceiling. Maybe with Jed Fish in there with his staff, they can pull off another Cinderella story. Although I don't think last year's story was Cinderella. They didn't blow anyone out, but they controlled games and and worked teams and coaching staffs. That was an elite team last year. I look at Washington, and I don't know where to place their future. It's certainly higher than UCLA's. I can't put it above USC's and certainly not above Oregon's right now. But I do think that Washington, USC, and Oregon have – good futures or at least above average and and UCLA's is probably the the one that's in that bad category the below average category which means quite frankly some teams in the Big Ten are going to be pushed down into the lower tier yeah and then and this is a little bit of a side tangent but when I know you want to you want to stay on time here so just really quick I'm curious how you think, just just quickly, how you think that these Pac-12 teams joining the Big Ten will affect recruiting for certain squads. Because cer- suddenly, if you're a Maryland and you just went from being the fifth dog in the conference to being the sixth, seventh, eighth dog in the conference, how does that affect kids wanting to go there? Does that knock your recruiting down a step? Maybe it doesn't, but that's some something that I'd like to keep an eye on. That is interesting. Uh Basically, all the school, it'll make it harder for a team like Michigan State or Wisconsin, teams who have recruited well in the past. But those are very few. The Big Ten, and and you know this, it's really been Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, and then recruiting just take, and Nebraska, too. It'll affect Nebraska, but it's been those three, and then there's a, a cliff drop, and then really everyone else is kind of closer. But Nebraska, Michigan State, and Wisconsin, I think their lives will be made harder because they are they don't have that blue blood reputation or the powerhouse reputation that in Ohio State, Penn State, and Michigan do. Oregon will jump with those three. USC, at least on a recruiting re- level and reputation level, will jump with those four. So... Yeah, I I think for some schools it'll be harder, but for your Minnesota, your Illinois, your Iowa, um, Matt Rule's doing well at recruiting with Nebraska, so I don't expect them to take a step back. I think they'll continue to recruit well. Maryland hasn't recruited well for the past several seasons either. I think they focus more on development. It'll change somewhat. I think it's a good question and one that I can't exactly answer, but I'd be more inclined saying things will probably stay the same especially given that the Big Ten and the SEC are obviously the two best conferences in the country now, and it's not even close. It, it really is, like, instead of two groups, the Power Five and the Group of Five, it's three groups now. Thank you so much for watching this episode of College Football with Sam. I appreciate it, and I would appreciate it even more if you were to hit that like button, comment your thoughts on this video down below, hit that big red subscribe button, and also click that notification bell so that your phone, laptop, or whatever device you use can ding or buzz whenever I release new content and notify you about it so that you can watch more videos like this. College Football with Sam is the best Big Ten football channel on YouTube. We're going to be doing a giveaway when we hit 20,000 subscribers, and we're trying to become one of the best, if not the best, college football channels on YouTube. Your support means so much, and to those of you who are subscribed to my Patreon or purchase merchandise from my store, the links to those are down in the description and pinned comment. Thank you so much. I want to give a shout out to my Patreons. Thanks to Crash2488 for being a Heisman member. Thanks to Spencer Bringhurst, Chris Lane, and Connor Little OH for being all American members, and thanks to Will Loftus, John Lynn, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Austin Christmas, and Janisha Cockrell for being all conference members. Have a great day, guys, and if you're listening on Spotify or any non-YouTube podcast platform, please check the link in the channel description to find my YouTube channel, and if you're listening on YouTube, feel free to check out my Spotify, if you so please.
Have a great day, guys, and I will see you all soon. Bye-bye.